So last week we spoke about God with us, and we sort of zeroed in on that, who that is that is us. Uh, in, gene in the genealogy of Jesus' family, we see us, the good, the bad, you know, the crazy, everyone, all of our family is there. Jesus comes to us not as the people that we should be or want to be or think that someday we're going to be. He comes to us just as we are. But still questions emerge. How does this occur? And it's interesting that both in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel, these, these issues are addressed head on. This is how it happens. So let me read from Luke's gospel, the first chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to make, take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the prophet through the, by the, <clears throat> excuse me, spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I love how Matthew works here. He puts in these little short phrases that are, well, I hate to say this, so pregnant with meaning. In this case, it is now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. This way, not another way. It happens in a particular way. And in fact, it is a shocking way, an amazing way, and after I read this, I take the point of Joseph because naturally Matthew writes from the perspective of Joseph and I must confess to you that sometimes when I hear stories like this from God, I go, hmm. And I want to give the Lord some suggestions on how he might improve his customer service, you know? <laughs> Have you ever done that before? Have you ever been faced with a crisis or a, a decision and you're waiting for a word from the Lord? Maybe you get the word from the Lord and you're like, well, yeah, um, could we have something slightly different? In this case, my suggestion to the Lord would have been, why didn't you tell Joseph before she got pregnant? Right? Doesn't that make infinite sense? Yeah, the guys are like, yes. I mean, just imagine she's found to be pregnant. Imagine in his own heart the anxious nights, the pacing backwards and forwards, the wondering what to do, how to handle this, the dashing of his dreams, all those feelings welling up and washing over him. But then an angel appears to him in a dream and sets him straight. My friends, 
This is how it works. This is how God operates in our world. And it's important for us to see this not just as an event that happens once in history. It does. It is unique. The birth of Jesus by a virgin is extraordinary and unique, but it bears the thumbprints of God's activity that has taken place all through history. And here's, here's the pattern. Something needs to happen in this world. In this case, it's saving humanity from their sins that requires a God-sized action, something that only God can do. This is not a course correction. This is a complete spiritual revolution in our world. And so God does something that is that is fit with that, that is meat. A virgin shall conceive, and they shall call him Emmanuel. But then when God does this great thing, this overpowering wonder that just blows us away, he needs a volunteer. He needs somebody to make sure that this thing is carried forward. He just doesn't do it without hu human participation. In this case, he says, oh, and Joseph, by the way, this is how God works. Do you remember how Moses was called to lead the children of Israel? Saw the burning bush, God says, you're gonna lead Moses, who is a wanted criminal in Egypt, says you're going to go back and have a conversation with Pharaoh, and then you're going to lead my people to freedom. And Moses is like, okay, can I have a sign, please? And God says, yes, you may. When you get back here with all those people, you'll know that, you have, uh, that I am the Lord. That's, no, I, I, I want the sign before we get there, right? God says, no, no. Listen, this is how God works. Remember that fellow, Noah? God is going to cleanse the earth. He does this monumental act. But then he gets some guy, some guy to build this enormous ark to save his creation. This is how God works. When Simon Peter was called by Jesus You'll remember that Jesus told him to cast his nets in a certain part of the water. Drop them down over here. Peter, who had been fishing all night, is like, <sighs> Rabbi, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let the nets down. And then when the catch was so great, it began to sink the boat. Peter could only say, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. I mean, he saw the thunderous power of God in this rabbi, and it blew him away. And Jesus' words to him were, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. You see, this is how God works. God does God-sized things and then invites us, calls us, to be partners in that ministry. And the wonder of it all is that we become then God's people because of what happens here. Emmanuel saves us from our sins. So the, the lesson that I have here today is very simple. Yes, it is good to ask God to do something big. Yes, it is to, it's great to rely on God's holy will and say, you know, just save me. Save my family. Save this situation. Rescue us. Deliver us. Do something God-sized. I mean, how many here have ever prayed that prayer? I need you to do some of that God stuff 
for me and my loved ones. We need you. But a word ahead. The next movement then is when he delivers you is he will come calling and invite you to join him. This is the message of Advent. It's twofold. On the one hand, God is redeeming us. On the second hand, he's calling us. So, my friends, it is a joyous time and a glad occasion for me to announce to you that we have been delivered from our sins. That God has made provision for all of our weakness, all of our foolishness, just our mean-spiritedness. God has made provision for that and delivered us from every bit of it. It happened on the cross. It begins right here. But then, but then, as he always does, he comes calling. And when the women show up at the tomb and look for Jesus, Jesus dead and cold, they don't find him. But what they do find is a living and loving Lord who says, come follow me. Tell my disciples to meet me. It is important to pray for God-sized things. It is important for us to expect God to be God. But part of God being God is he invites us to join in and be a part of the process. Now, I must tell you that most people don't get this. Most people can read this story and not see themselves being welcomed and called and commissioned in this story. But Joseph is one of us. He is one of those people that make up the people whom God is with. Joseph's story is our story. Now, I don't know if anybody here is going to get pregnant next week. <laughs> but God is going to move among us. I remember a bishop once said to me, Bishop Cornelius Henderson, which one of the finest bishops I've ever known in the Florida Conference, said that the church needs to be a body of people of miraculous expectations. That is to say... We're not just plowing our way through life, just trying to make a living, just trying to survive, get by, get from one doctor's appointment to the other, right? Get through one trial, to through another, one conflict, but rather we should expect and anticipate and look forward to do great and mighty wonders, just as the choir sung last night, in our midst as a body of believers. Will you pray with me that that will happen? Not only in the United Methodist denomination, but the church around the world. And not just the church around the world, but the church right here on this plot of ground. Let's pray together, shall we? Almighty and everlasting God, you move in such amazing ways. You blow us away by your mighty acts of love, your deliverance that seems to defy the odds, the way in which you pour out your spirit and call us sometimes scares us a little bit, sometimes it makes us feel inadequate, but oh God, help us to see now the joy of your salvation. You have done a great and mighty wonder among us. And now we pray, O oh God, come give us an angel, someone who will speak on your behalf. Come give us an angel, someone who can say across a coffee table or perhaps 
in a Sunday school class or, or maybe at a covered dish dinner, somewhere, somewhere in our lives, in the body of Christ, an angel to quietly call us so that we see our parts in your plan. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen.